The Democratic Party is not the party of Kennedy Roosevelt anymore. Now it's the party of free housing, big government, climate emergencies, and social spending projects. Oh, and LeBron and Kevin, you're great players, but no one voted for you. Millions elected Trump to be their coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. The green M&M, you will notice, is no longer wearing sexy boots. Now she's wearing sensible sneakers. Why the change? Well, according to M&Ms, quote, we all win when we see more women in leading roles because leading women do not wear sexy boots. Leading women wear frumpy shoes. The frumpier, the better. That's the rule. This should never happen again. And I can guarantee you it will happen again unless we make an example of the traitorous, treasonous group that accused Donald Trump of being an agent of the Russian government. And when I saw this headline, I kind of laughed and I said, oh, this is so ridiculous. Yet another person claiming it's racist to have a white Santa, you know? And by the way, for all you kids watching at home, Santa just is white, but this person is just arguing that, that maybe we should, we should also have a black Santa. But you know, Santa is what he is. And just so you know, we're just debating this because someone wrote about it, kids. In an interview with the New York Times, former Fox News host, Chris Wallace, called working with the network unsustainable. Hi, I'm Yasmin Khan with Rebel HQ, and Chris Wallace has become like a very strange glimmer of hope for a lot of us watching the active polarization of mainstream media and fearing what can come of it. Of course, we've already seen plenty of what can and has come of it. The world of media is one that's full of conflictions and contradictions, dissynchronous goals and warring parties. There are people to exploit and people to capitalize on. Global affairs are reduced to internet fodder and pithy headlines designed to capture the attention of an attention deficient populace. And as much as we all try to separate ourselves from the chatter and the noise, it's very difficult to do so. There are so many celebrities that I know so much more about than I've ever cared to learn. And that's with my own personal efforts to not click on links or post to stories that I don't care about. But let's take it back to 2015, when Donald Trump was ramping up his first presidential campaign. Back then, I was working for an internet marketing company, and a big part and decidedly the worst part of my day was every morning when I would have to sit on Twitter to find you know, content for our clients to tweet about. It would literally give me anxiety, which is probably why you don't see me on Twitter very often these days. But it was all there. I could have predicted the four years that were about to follow just from watching the patterns that were emerging on Twitter, watching the world turn in 2015, and it was all horrifying. Every time Trump would say something, every soundbite more inflammatory than the last, it would trend. You know, people would talk about it, sure, but the media, the news outlets were also covering it incessantly. How do you make a bully go away? You ignore the bully. We didn't ignore Trump, and we really, really should have. Because the more you hear something, the more normalized it becomes, which is crucially distinct from the fact that more normal does not mean more true. In Chris Wallace's interview, he admits that he could be considered a slow learner, and that his involvement with Fox should have probably been over sooner rather than later. But, you know, breakups are difficult. Sometimes it's easier to stay in a toxic situation than it is to just leave it and give up all hope of what it could be, release all the memories of what it once was and move on, cutting all your losses, eating all the sunk costs, and removing yourself from the situation entirely. The tipping point for Wallace came in November 2020, when his colleagues at Fox were pushing unfounded allegations of election tampering. They were downplaying a Trump-inspired insurrection at the Capitol, and they were supporting efforts to overturn a Democratic presidential election. Personally, I'm never going to fault someone for taking longer than they should to get somewhere as long as they get there. Wallace got there, and in the time leading up to his departure from Fox, he was a much-needed voice of moderation and sensibility on an increasingly radical network. Some could argue that he should have stayed longer and tried to right the ship, but I mean, there's only so much that one person can do. 
So of course we have to ask, how did we get here? So you all know about the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC. They're the ones who wouldn't let Eminem be and they tried to shut him down on MTV, right? The FCC attempts to navigate very, very tricky terrain. In the nearly 100 years that it's been around, it's had varying degrees of success in doing so. For instance, there was the Fairness Doctrine of 1949, which was eventually repealed in the 80s under Reagan. It stated that if a network were to present one side of an argument, it would have to dedicate the same amount of screen time to present the other side of the argument. It's not perfect, but you can see what the intention behind it was. The FCC also attempts to regulate um, decency, so they're known for fining for the F-bomb and for nudity. That's why late night talk shows cringe visibly every time a guest has kind of a hot mouth. Every bleep comes with a price tag. And that's why CBS was fined for over half a million dollars following Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction of the 2004 Super Bowl halftime show in Houston. The Supreme Court eventually dismissed the fine, but not before Janet Jackson's music was pulled out of rotation by various outlets, damaging her career and reputation. But then we get to the now infamous Clinton-era Telecommunications Act of 1996. The act was primarily directed towards the regulation of the shiny new internet, an arena that the government admittedly is still trying to get a handle on 26 years later. Initially, there was a lot of concern over children getting access to pornographic content, but other concerns soon followed, such as music streaming and licensing, i.e. Napster versus Metallica, copyrighted materials, etc. I'm hesitant to be too hard on the people involved in getting this act passed, though, because it really was completely new and unfamiliar territory. The technology was moving so fast that people, let alone the government, could barely keep up with it. It was a crazy time. But, assuming positive intent, the big downside of the Telecom Act was that it allowed smaller media companies to merge with larger ones to give them access to a bigger network and a bigger audience. Positive intent aside, it probably wouldn't have been too hard to foresee that mergers would eventually lead to monopolies, and monopolies, especially in media, lead to polarization. The messaging has to be consistent, right? If you agree to join a team, you have to be all in on that team. There's less room for individualism, which leads to less nuanced discussions of topics. Eventually, stories are reduced to talking points that more or less are parroted across platforms within the same monopoly. I don't think I need to explain that any further, though. This is something that I imagine we're all pretty familiar with. Anyway, Chris Wallace found himself mixed up in all of this, working for a network that dominated right-wing media with little to no attempts at balanced or even factual news coverage. When Fox News started promoting anchors like Tucker Carlson, who isn't even expected to be factual in his quote-unquote reporting anymore, it was a clear indication that the network was prioritizing sensationalism over actual journalism. So where does this leave us? We find ourselves in a struggle between a truly laissez-faire, free speech, free press, free market, and government regulation that is intended to protect its citizens. People need access to information, especially in a democratic society. Voters can only vote based on what they know. It's literally in the Bill of Rights because democracy cannot function without freedom of press. We see a lot of muddling between what is actual free speech and what is just a lie told publicly. As we know, a lie told to enough people becomes almost factual, at least functionally, if enough people believe it. People believe things when they hear them enough times, so monopoly-wide talking points don't help. The solution? I don't know. Independent media certainly helps, but it's hard for smaller media companies to get off the ground when they're up against corporate interests and litigious regulators. Then there's the issue of censorship. Who can say what, when? Where can lines be drawn and should lines be drawn at all? What's the difference between intentionally misleading the public and Tucker Carlson just asking? Is it better for media to be regulated by capitalistic mechanisms or by governmental legislation? And is the media even separate from the government? If not, should it be? Either way, it might be time for some monopoly busting. But in the meantime, until that happens, pay attention to your clicks. 
The more you click, the more you get. You get more of whatever you click on because corporations make money off of your clicks. If you don't click, you take away their incentive to produce similar content. It's a tricky balance between enabling coverage of toxic players and staying informed, especially like me in 2015 and then in 2016 when that toxic player became my president. But I don't know, this is terrible advice, but just stay vigilant, try to expose yourself to various types of media and different materials, read some books, verify your sources as much as possible, and try to consume consciously.